Hello and thank you for joining us once again on this fifth episode of our look at the Northumberland castles and this will actually be our final episode in the series. Today we begin the southern end of the county and the castles that lie in the Tyne Valley area. Some of these castles are just impossible to get into. So if you're familiar with the area and you, you know of a castle, for example, Blenkinsop or Dilston, <coughs> they're not going to appear simply because I just couldn't get in to see them. Today we are at Prudder and we'll be going into the castle shortly to have a look around. This one is literally situated on the very south of the border and it's one of the areas of Northumberland that actually dips below the River Tyne so we're actually on the south side of the River Tyne and it's a very special castle because it's the only one that didn't get captured by the Scots it was the only one that they never took um, and so it stands apart from the others simply because of that. The name Prudder is Anglo-Saxon. The first part of the name Prud means proud and Ho is a hof, which is a, a valley or a spur of land. Prudder is therefore a spur of land situated above its surroundings and stands on a ridge some 50 metres above the River Tyne. The first castle here was a timber Norman Mott and Bailey and built around 1095. It was part of a series of Norman fortifications built along the Tyne shortly after the invasion of 1066. The large area of land surrounding the castle was the barony of Prudder and it was given to the de Umfreville family by William the Conqueror. We've already heard of the Umfravilles um, owning most of Reedsdale to the north um, but also Coketdale and parts of Angus in Scotland. So they were a very powerful family and a very wealthy family. We've already heard a few times now that after William the Conqueror, William Rufus, his son, took the throne. And when he died, Henry I of England succeeded. But when Henry died without an heir, it was William the Conqueror's grandson, Stephen, that took the throne. Stephen gave Prudder and the earldom of Northumberland to the Scots, and the Umfravilles and many of the northern nobles had to attend the Scottish royal court instead of the English court. However, when Stephen died, Henry II succeeded the throne and he reclaimed Northumberland and so the Umfravilles in 1151 had to switch allegiance back to the English king and attend the English court once again. William I of Scotland who preferred to be called William the Lion um, was absolutely outraged at this and as we remember from the earlier episodes, in 1173, um, a revolt was started against King Henry by his wife and sons. So William saw his opportunity to join this revolt and reclaim Northumberland as part of his kingdom in Scotland. So he marched south and successfully took Annick, but was unable to take Newcastle and Prudder as they were too strong and his army wasn't trained sufficiently because it was a bit of a last-minute random attack 
and so he returned to Scotland defeated. William returned a year later in 1174, this time with a more accomplished army and a larger army, but only to find that the castle had been strengthened. He lay siege to the castle for three days, but after not making any progress at all, decided to head back to Annick and try his luck at Annick seen as he had been successful a year before in taking that. There he made the fatal mistake of allowing his troops to spread out and as he encamped for the night uh, prior to his planned attack on Anik, a small group of seasoned knights left Newcastle and headed north to confront William. They managed to sneak up on him in the dawn fog and caught him still sleeping. In the chaos that ensued, William tried to get to his horse, but before he could engage in battle, it was, his horse was killed and cut down beneath him. William was captured and initially taken to Newcastle and then transported to Falaise Castle in France. He was offered his release, but only in exchange for signing the Treaty of Falaise, which basically signed over all lands and castles in Berwick, Roxburgh, Jedburgh, Edinburgh and Stirling, and signed them all over to the English. As I mentioned in episode one, the Treaty of Falaise lasted 15 years, until Henry II's death in 1189. After that, Richard I, the third son of uh, Henry, uh, became king, and he was better known as Richard the Lionheart. He sold the lands back to William um, to fund the Crusades, of course, in the Holy Land. The attempt by William in 1174 was the last attempt by a Scottish king to reclaim Northumberland as theirs. An interesting little fact which doesn't appear in the history books was the fact that the Scots were so peeved at uh, not being able to take Prudder on both occasions that before they left to march back to Annick they stripped all the bark off the trees in the orchard, some sort of peevish revenge. And so Prudder can claim itself as the last bastion of English resistance against the Scottish claim to Northumberland. Of course, it didn't stop the Scots invading England uh, in 1297 by William Wallace and in 1314 by Robert the Bruce. Um, but total peace would not come until 1603 when James VI of Scotland and I of England united the two nations and brought an end to the um, border conflicts. The barony for Prudder passed from Odenel de Umfreville um, to his son Richard in 1182. He lost Prudder in forfeit for opposing King John and Prudder fell into crown ownership for a while. After King John's death in 1217, Prudder was given back to Richard's son Gilbert de Umfreville. The Umfrevilles kept falling out with the monarchs after King John until 1308 when they supported Edward I in his war against Scotland. Gilbert's son Robert was captured at Bannockburn in 1314 by Robert the Bruce. Um, he was released, but had to forfeit his lands in Scotland. 
In 1381, the last de Umfreville, another Gilbert, died without an heir. So without an Umfreville heir, in step the Percys. Gilbert's widow, Matilda de Lucy, married Henry Percy, the first Earl of Northumberland from Annick, and they took over Prudder, making them the most powerful noble family in Northumberland at that point. Of course, we know they've already owned Walkworth and Annick in the north, and the Percys added a new great hall to this castle after acquiring it. And as we already know from our visits to Walkworth and Annick earlier in the series, the Percys, just like the de Umfravilles, were constantly falling out with the monarchs of the day in the various barons' wars. Throughout the next 250 years or so, Prudder Castle constantly passed back and forth between crown ownership and the Percys, just as it did with Annick and Walkworth. When the Percys made Annick their primary residence, Prudder fell into disrepair. Hugh Percy, the second Duke, carried out substantial repairs in 1808, but that was the last work to be carried out here. In 1966, the castle was given to the crown by the Percys, and in turn, it was put into the custody of English heritage, as I said at the beginning. Hello, and here we are at Aden Castle, also referred to as Aden Hall. Um, in the Tyne Valley, a mile or so north of Corbridge in Northumberland. Here we have our first existing example of a fortified manor house that hasn't been extended or altered in any way into a full-blown castle or replaced with a tower. We'll be going inside in a moment to have a look. It's pretty spectacular and I'm really pleased we included it in the series. You get a good idea inside of what these manor houses would have been like and you get an inkling of how life would have been. The original structure here though was a timber built hall house and the history is unclear as to who actually owned it. Whoever it was had fallen on hard times 
Uh, and in 1293, a wealthy merchant from Ipswich bought it called Hugh de Rames with the intention of increasing his social status and influence. Legal complications delayed the sale till 1296 and Hugh died a year before. His son Robert took ownership and made it his primary residence. His intention was to fight with Edward I against the Scots and was involved in the defeat of William Wallace at Falkirk. Presumably he was rewarded by Edward for his support and the money was used to build the first stone structure here. As the border wars escalated, Robert was granted permission to crenellate the house and you can see the crenellations in various places around the property. By 1311, frequent Scottish reaver raids had begun ransacking the surrounding area, but Aden Hall resisted capture. After the English defeat at Bannockburn, life in Northumberland became dire, as it lay largely unprotected by Edward II's decimated army and weak leadership. Robert Rames was captured at Bannockburn and the demand of £500 for his ransom, it left him and his family financially ruined. Aidan was captured in 1315 and was pillaged and burned. In 1317, the English border reavers looted and destroyed what the Scots had left. By this time, the estate was worthless and Rames died in 1324 penniless. Rames' son, also called Robert, inherited what was left of the estate and managed to rebuild the hall and add it to the fortifications that had existed prior to its destruction. When he died in 1349, he had managed to recover some of the family fortune so that his son Nicholas could enjoy a successful life. <clears throat> Nicholas was supported at Aden by Henry Percy, the third Baron Percy, and this was the best time of all for Aden Hall. By the mid-1400s, the family were struggling to maintain their position and were forced to sell Aden. Over the following centuries, Aden had several owners, many simply lodged tenants there. No further changes or improvements were made. By the 1600s, it was used as a farmhouse and that continued until 1966 when it became an historic site and English heritage manage it today. Hello again and here we are on another fabulous day in Northumberland and this time we are at Halton Castle which is literally just a mile or so along the road to the north of Aden Castle where we've just visited. Halton Fort as it was appeared as a Roman fort in the year 122 and one of 17 built along Hadrian's Wall. It's thought that the garrison here were mixed infantry and cavalry and the site would have extended over four acres of land. It's not clear what happened to Halton Fort when the Romans left in 388, but the next mention of it is in 1287 when it came to the ownership of John de Halton. He used the ample supply of dressed stone from the abandoned Roman fort to build a stone hall surrounded by a curtain wall like we saw at Aden. 
Further fortifications were added after the outbreak of war with the Scots in 1296 and then following the Scots victory at Bannockburn in 1314. As we have heard already, Northumberland became a wild, lawless and extremely dangerous place to live. The castle was abandoned by the family for a period of time as they moved further south to Hexham for safety. The castle was re-inhabited for a time in 1382 by Robert de Lowther and after his death it passed to a William Carnaby. He was captured following a Scottish raid in 1385 and that prompted the Carnabys to erect the Peel Tower you can see there behind me um, with the four corner turrets. Sometime in the early 1400s the Carnabys added a manor house to the side of the tower. In 1695, Halton passed to Sir John Douglas, 3rd Baron of Kelhead, near Annan in Dumfrieshire. He demolished the manor house and replaced it with a Jacobean wing, which you can see remaining here today. And the castle is a private residence and not open to the public. Hello and today we are at Chipchase Castle um, which is in Wark near Hexham not to be confused with the Wark we visited in episode 1 at Carham. We can't get in to see this one uh, close up. Today Chipchase has a new owner who only allows large corporations in to film for huge fees. The previous owner Paul Torday the author of Salmon Fishing in the Yemen was a bit more amenable and did allow visits, but sadly, no more. Um, this is the closest we can get to it, and um, it's worth including, um, which was why I, I kept it in the series. Settlements go back here as far as the Bronze Age, and it was quite densely populated right through the Iron Age and Roman occupation. However, no evidence has been found to suggest the Anglo-Saxons were here. Chip Chase is first mentioned in the records in 1261 when it was owned by a Peter de Insula. At that time it's thought to have been a fortified manor house like we saw at Aden. Peter's great-grandson Robert bequeathed the estate to his granddaughter Cecily. Robert granted Cecily's hand in marriage to any of the three sons of William Heron at Ford Castle. William, Walter or John were the three sons. She chose Walter and they inherited the castle and their descendants kept possession of it for the next 350 years. You might recall we mentioned the Herons at Ford Castle in the first episode. Well, this is the same family. The big difference is Walter Heron was appointed Sheriff of Northumberland and while his relatives at Ford were fighting with the Manners family at Eatle. William Heron was imprisoned, you will recall, by Henry Percy for carrying out a reaver raid in a time of truce with the Scots. Walter Heron demolished the original house and built a huge four-storey tower house with the turreted corners still standing today. In 1541 it was owned by his son John Heron who added a manor house to the side of the tower. The manor was demolished in 1621 by his descendant Cuthbert Heron who replaced it with a Jacobean mansion, which is still there today. His son George was killed in 1624 at the Battle of Marston Moor in defence of King Charles I in the First Civil War of England. 
His younger son Cuthbert was made baronet by Charles II when the monarchy was restored in 1660. By the early 1700s, the Heron had hit financial difficulties and were forced to sell the estate. It was bought by John Reed, a Newcastle banker, in 1734. He carried out extensive alterations to the castle, but by 1821 he too was forced to sell the estate due to the collapse of his bank, and it was then sold to the Grey family. Today the castle is privately owned by an American owner, Jonathan Elkington, who is an investment banker in London. And as I said at the beginning, the castle is not open to the public anymore, unfortunately. Hello again, and today we are at Bywell, a very small hamlet literally on the edge of the north bank uh, of the River Tyne, opposite to Stocksfield. The castle here was built in 1090 by a Norman nobleman, Guy de Baliol, who also owned Barnard Castle in County Durham. You will remember from episode three that the Percys of Annick lost their lands to the Neville family. It was in that same period this castle was also owned by the Nevilles. They strengthened it and added a gatehouse and a curtain wall. No real incidents of any note happened here apart from one. In 1464, after Henry VI lost the Battle of Hexham, he fled here and hid for a short while. His enemies were close on his heels and when Lord Montague arrived in Bywell, he found the King's crown, helmet and sword, but Henry was nowhere to be found. The Battle of Hexham was of course one of the many battles in the Wars of the Roses and a small but significant victory for the Yorkists. Henry was eventually found hiding in Clitheroe in Lancashire. And as I've already mentioned, not much else happened here. As with all of the castles in Northumberland, after 1603 they lost their importance after the unification of England and Scotland. Um, and the castle fell into disrepair. The castle was converted into a private residence in the 1800s and is presently owned by Wentworth Beaumont, the fourth Viscount of Allendale. It's not open to the public, though once a year the gardens are opened up for a day to view. This is Thirlwell Castle, close to Greenhead on the A69 between Newcastle and Carlisle. The land here was controlled by Malcolm IV of Scotland between 1153 and 1165. It was given to the Thirlwell family, who took the name of their new barony to be their surname and built a timber manor house on this particular site. The name Thirlwall comes from the Old English words Thirl, meaning a hole or gap, and wall because we are literally on the top of Hadrian's Wall. It ran right through this site. So Thirlwall meaning gap in the wall. In 1305, William Wallace was betrayed by John Menteith, and of course he was captured, tried and executed in London. Edward I placed Emma de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, and Henry Percy, Baron of Northumberland, in charge of governing Scotland. The Scots were not happy at being ruled by the English. So in 1306, Robert the Bruce murdered his rival, John Common, and was crowned King of Scotland. 
He immediately embarked on a campaign to free Scotland of English rule. Edward I stayed here in 1306 on his way to meet with the northern barons. He died, of course, a year later of dysentery just outside Carlisle before he could stop Bruce. As we know, Edward II, Edward's son, was weak and lacked leadership. Scottish confidence grew because of that, especially after their resounding victory at Bannockburn in 1314, and their raids into Northern England increased. These increased raids um, prompted John Thirlwall in 1330 to rebuild the manor house in stone, and the stone was plundered entirely from Hadrian's Wall uh, on a man-made mound of earth. They weren't a rich family, but because all the stone was free and ready cut, um, they could afford to build a sizeable stone castle. There are no records of the castle having been attacked during this period. A later descendant of the family, Sir Percival Thirlwall, was the standard bearer for Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. He heroically kept the flag aloft despite having his legs cut from under him. You will remember from the second episode when we visited Walkworth that Henry Percy, um, the fourth Earl of Northumberland, was meant to deploy his army in support of Richard during the battle. Of course, we know Henry Percy didn't support Richard, um, which almost certainly led to his defeat and the certain death of Percival Thirlwall. The castle's only recorded battle was in the English Civil War of 1642 to 1646, when it was seized by Scots supporting the parliamentarians against Charles I. The castle was badly damaged and not worth repairing. Eleanor Thirlwall, the last of the family, abandoned the castle and went to live in nearby Hexham. Her marriage in 1738 to Matthew Swinburne meant the estate belonged to him, and he sold it to the Earl of Carlisle for £4,000 ten years later. The Earl was only interested in the land and not the castle, and so it fell into disrepair and serious decay. It's managed today by the Northumberland National Park Authority and it's open to the public without charge. Hello and once again another glorious day here in Northumberland. Um, this is Langley Castle and some of you will immediately recognise it as a hotel and popular wedding venue. Um, just a mile or so up the road from Hayden Bridge in Northumberland. The lands here originally belonged to the Tyndale family, descendants of the Baron of Tyndale uh, during the 1100s. The castle was built around 1350 by Sir Thomas de Lucy 
a wealthy and powerful Norman nobleman. It was built to a Norman template of an H-shaped four-storey tower. The only skirmish here was in 1405 when King Henry IV attacked it with his army and severely damaged it. That was in the campaign against the Percys and the Northern Barons. You'll remember from our visit to uh, Walkworth in episode two that Henry Percy had supported King Henry in overthrowing his cousin Richard II, along with several other barons and lords. They were promised money, lands and royal favour in return. But when the king didn't keep his promise, uh, the northern barons led by Henry Percy began a revolt. That revolt resulted in the Battle of Shrewsbury in July of 1403, in which Henry Percy was killed. Langley Castle remained a ruin for the next 477 years until 1882 when it was bought by Cadwallader Bates. Bates was the son of a gentleman farmer from Hexham in Northumberland and had been educated at Eton. Four of his uncles died without heirs leaving their fortune to Bates his father, Thomas, also passed in 1882, leaving his fortune to him as well. Bates became the High Sheriff for Northumberland and being a historian and antiquarian, set about restoring Langley as his lifetime project. Before the restoration was complete, he had a heart attack and died in March of 1902. His much younger widow continued to live at the castle and continued with the restoration until her own death in 1932. The castle then remained empty until it was used as an army barracks in the Second World War. Um, after the war, it was used as a girls' school and in 1980 it was bought by the Robb family and in 1986 it was bought by the present owner who is Dr Stuart Madnick, a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It was he who converted it into a luxury hotel as it still is today. Hello, and today we are at Featherston Castle, close to Hadrian's Wall and just west of Holtwhistle in Northumberland. Soon after the Romans left Britain, the Saxons invaded and they set about pushing the Britons north into Scotland and west into Wales. The land here was given to a Saxon officer for his bravery against the Britons and as with most families throughout history took their surname from the place they inhabited. In this case the name was Featherstone Hoff. Featherstone came from feudal stones 
which I will elaborate on in a minute, and Hof, which is a local word meaning valley. The first house that the family lived in was on high ground, occupied by two monolithic feuder stones, similar to those at Stonehenge, though not as large. The feudal system in England that existed in that period dictated that landholders would give lands to tenants in return for their loyalty and service. The feudal tenants of the area would meet at these stones. It's thought that the early house was destroyed by the many Scottish raids over the years. Sometime in the 11th century, another hall was built in the Hof, or valley, giving rise to the family name Featherstone Hof. In 1212, the area was owned by a Helius Featherstone Hof, and it remained with his family for 12 generations. The tower was added around 1330 by Thomas Featherstone Hoff, who held great power in the area. During the first civil war in the early 1640s, another descendant, a Timothy Featherstone Hoff, fought for Charles I. He was caught during the Battle of Wigan Lane in 1651 and beheaded. To pay for the losses incurred, the castle was sold to William Howard of Naworth. He was the Earl of Carlisle and substantial improvements were carried out during this time. The family did buy the castle back eventually but had to sell it again by 1789. After that it had several owners. There were no major battles here but it did play an important role in Northumberland's history due to the Featherstone Hoff's family's involvement and influence in the area. So Featherstone Castle may not have been involved in any major skirmishes um, but it does have a very well told ghost story. The legend begins with the fact of Nicholas Featherstone Hoff being murdered by Richard Ridley on the 24th of October 1530 as part of an ongoing feud between the two families. The rest is legend and it goes something like this. Apparently the Baron of Featherston had arranged the marriage of his daughter Abigail to Ridley, his rival, who she did not love. Unable to stop the proceedings, she was forced to marry him. The Baron sent the wedding party out on a hunt as part of the wedding celebration. When the party reached the woods, her lover ambushed them in an attempt to steal her away. A fight broke out and as Ridley thrust his sword um, towards her lover, she threw herself in the way and was killed. Her lover killed Ridley and then killed himself, bereft at her loss, holding her hand as he died. The Baron awaited the wedding party's return and sent servants out to find them, but to no avail. At midnight, the ghosts of all those who died galloped through the gates of the castle and took their places at the reception table, displaying their wounds before fading away into the ether of the night. On the anniversary of the wedding, at midnight each year, the ghosts appear riding between the woods and the castle. Anyway, whether you believe in ghosts or not, uh, that's the legend, that's the story. 
Um, I do know of people who've sworn that they've seen such apparitions, um, but you'll have to make up your own mind for that. Uh, I would like to thank the owner of the castle, uh, Sir John Clark, um, for his very kind permission to be here today and to uh, have a look around the castle. So thank you very much to him. Hello, and just before episode five is released, I wanted to share this little bit of interesting information with you. I received a message from a subscriber, um, a Paul Sutton, uh, four days ago, um, and he shared a little bit of information with me um, that I wanted to share with you. And it was regarding Preston Tower, which is where we are today again. Um, and of course, Preston Tower was on episode three. And this is what he wrote. My mother was Mary Alice Harbottle, 15 times great granddaughter to Robert Harbottle, who built Preston Tower. He was the constable of Dunstanborough Castle, surveyor and commissioner to Roxburgh Castle in Scotland, and twice the Sheriff of Northumberland, Escheta and briefly Warden of the Eastern March of Scotland. Um, you'll understand most of that from the um, information I've given you in this series. Um, Escheta, um, what's that? Well, an Escheta was an officer in charge of Escheats. And Escheats were um, when a landowner or um, a state owner died without an heir. Um, in feudal law in medieval Britain, that would mean that the land would be passed to the monarch or the crown and the escheta was the officer in charge of dealing with that. So that's a nice little bit of information um, that I wanted to share with you before this final episode goes out um, and a great thank you to Paul Sutton for sharing that with us. In addition to watching this series online, um, I have produced a Blu-ray version of the series and a DVD version. If you would like to own um, a permanent copy of these on disc, then the information is on the bottom of the screen now as to how to obtain one of those. The films I made last year um, the Northumberland Coast, Rural Northumberland and the Scottish Borders are also available on Blu-ray or DVD. Um, contact me in the same way if you would like to have your own copy. Thank you. Well, that's it folks. Last castle and the last episode. Um, and we started with a perfect blue sky and we started here at Bambra, which is my favourite castle. And I couldn't think of a better place to end it all on. Um, I hope you've enjoyed watching it. It's been an absolute pleasure making this series for you. Um, it took eight months to do the research for it uh, and an actual four months to film it. Met lots of nice people along the way and actually met some of my subscribers. So that was wonderful. Thank you for all your nice comments and positive feedback. Um, this winter I'll be doing the research for next year's projects. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching. 
please subscribe to the channel it does make a big difference and goodbye for now and I will see you all again very soon.